Hi, good afternoon, Veronica and Zoran. How are you guys today? Very well, thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We're really well. How, how are things in Sweden these days? How is the weather today? In London, we always start by talking about the weather. Always. <laughs> it's, it's just a typical thing. Yeah, we do the same. We do the same. Um, yeah, today is okay. I think it's supposed to be snow tomorrow, so I'm very excited about that in April. Snow in April, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a famous Swedish uh, pre-spring weather. I think they actually call it the fifth season, right? Because yeah. I think it's 15 degrees out now, but uh, today it's going to snow and then yeah, you never know for... And then it'll go back. We, we had a similar thing last week. It actually snowed and went sunny on the very same day. It was snowing in the morning and then later on in the afternoon, it was actually relatively warm. People were just out in t-shirts. Yeah, hilarious April weather. Um, great. Thank you guys for joining us today. Really great to have you. Um, working culture at the end of the day this is what we're here to talk about what makes a great engineering working culture but before we dive into that i'd like you just to give our audience a little bit of an introduction um so if we can start with yourself veronica tell us about veronica what as a professional who's veronica feel free to add a few personal traits if you like and what is it that you do at kindred uh, so I work together with Saran uh, and other colleagues in uh, our technical uh, management team. I work as head of tech business delivery, um, so responsible for all the kind of key strategic uh, technical initiatives that we have, uh, delivering on those, as well as um, um, kind of compliance uh, related items um, and integration of third party um, platforms towards our operational platform. So it's quite a broad span, I would say, of, of uh, my team. Um, I've worked in Kindred since 2012, and I think I've worked in oh. every tech function. <laughs> uh, I worked in Sarans all function in, in dev for a while. I worked in QA for a while uh, as a performance engineer. Um, so I've had quite a different uh, amount of roles within Kindred tech, um, and um, I think that's quite beneficial for the position that I'm in now where we work sort of across all of tech and across um, kindred um, business as a whole. Um, and my background is in engineering, as I think most people in, uh, in tech are. Um, and um, I studied in the US uh, for quite a number of years, worked uh, there for a while, worked in Ireland for a while, and then landed back in good old Sweden. <laughs> Wait, so you moved back to Sweden with uh, kindred then? No, so I worked. Uh, I worked in uh, General Electric, uh, moving back to Sweden, um, and then I started uh, with different consulting companies. As I think, uh, Saren's background as well um, as a consultant first at Kindred, and then moving into sort of a full time position um, after that as well. Nice, nice. What about you, Soren? Um, so I'm uh, Soren, um, head of development. So I. Um, lead and oversee the development function in, in Kindred Tech, so I'm also part of tech management, as, as Veronica is. Um, my department houses all of the testers and, and developers, most of the software engineers that we have in Kindred globally. Um, we're a truly global function with teams from Sydney to soon to be the US and all of Europe in between. Um, I've I started in Kindred in 2010, like Veronica said, as a consultant, developer. Um, did a lot of, of coding and, and helped build a platform and then gradually moved into to formal leadership and managerial roles. And, and been doing that since 2013 was my first uh, official management role. So you basically both of you started the early 2010s. Um... In your case, Soren, it's just over a decade. In your case, Veronica, just under a decade. So yeah. you've, you, you, you've probably seen a different phases to yeah. uh, Kindred over the years. No, absolutely. I mean, when, when I started, um, the, what was then the, the platform team, basically most of the dev organization was, oh, well, it was basically one team, right? Um, when the team got into some 20 odd people, we split it into two teams, um, as you naturally would have to do. And uh, the ambition for this year is to be close to 500 people. So it's been quite a journey from 20 odd people to close to 500 this year. 
so so you went from 20 people now you are how many people at the moment uh, 430 maybe now wow it's one of these numbers that vary on a daily basis with all the recruitment we're doing but um we hope to be 470 480 at the end of the year incredible incredible for so so yeah qu quite quite a ride i suppose that that definitely will go into the the questions about the culture because that's not exactly um a not even a 100 percent increase why is that like a four or five hundred percent increase even more than that so okay so let's let's go dive let's go straight into it then veronica what in your in your in your expertise your opinion you've been a developer you've been in tech pretty much all your professional life you've seen different environments what makes a great engineering culture it's a big question. A million dollar yeah, question. Yeah, that's the t it's the topic. So <laughs> I mean, you can start by you can if you like. We can what we can say. What actually makes a bad engineering culture? <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been part of that at some point in our careers. Um, no, but I think I mean a, a great engineering culture. I think is is the ability to um, sort of keep that. You know, I, I think quite often within within tech we talk about kind of startup mentality and the freedom that you have sort of in a, a, with a startup feel, um, the autonomy that you have as a team. And I think that's kind of within sort of great engineering culture, that's what you strive to have, even though you grow as a company, uh, and even though kind of the challenges become larger and, uh, and more and more teams and um, um, communication across teams and collaboration across teams, I think that's kind of the, um, the key item. How do you um, how do you keep that sort of autonomy for the team, for them to be able to make decisions, to find solutions? Um, and so I think, yeah, in terms of great engineering culture, that's that's kind of a, a key aspect of it, being able to to maintain that and and um, have that kind of thrive. Why why is it, Soren? Why is it very important to actually maintain freedom and autonomy? I mean, if uh, as you grow, mm. why why even keep that? Why can't we just say, okay, well, we have the senior management. They are probably more in touch with the executives. They're more in touch with the executives from the sales and marketing. They understand. They have better understanding of what the customer wants. So why do we need to have that kind of autonomy? Why can't it just be top down? Well, I mean, um, um, you're you're right in one way, right? We 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 trust our our top level management to be very in tune with company strategies, but they are not the experts as at um, how we build systems. So we need to make sure that the experts on actually doing things, right? The, the super skilled doers who are the foundation of everything we build, the developers and testers and, and engineers, though they are the experts at, at um, building things, delivering things, doing it in the right way, doing it in the right order. Uh, we as managers need to sort of set visions and, and guidelines and strategies and, and roadmaps, but then let the, the individual developers and the, mainly the teams decide for themselves, how do we best go about building this for um, not only this week, but for a, a slightly longer focus and future, but not over planning things to, to try to build something that lives forever. Because I think the team also needs them to have that holistic ownership over time so they can own and live with the products that they build. So does this mean then, back to you, Veronica, in this case, does this mean that you were saying about the startup uh, culture, for example, how they have the autonomy and the freedom, does that mean this is the right working environment? Are, are we trying these days to replicate the startup environment in a large enterprise? Is that what we're supposed to do? Um, I think it's that balance that Saren talks about, right? I mean, as you grow, uh, as, uh, you know, potentially sort of your solution, solutions become more complex, your landscape becomes more complex, um, you have a bigger customer base, um, there's more things to consider, right? So you wouldn't be able to do it with kind of that really small startup, uh, five people at a table uh, anymore. Um, so I think there's, there's um, that balance of, you know, you, you have to be able to have people that can kind of look long term, set visions and strategies, making sure we're moving in the right direction, but then also kind of keeping that um, 
autonomy and kind of creative spirit within individual teams to solve uh, the the problems the best they can. Uh, and I think that's you know for uh, sort of in terms of recruitment as well. Um, I think that's kind of um, you know what you're striving for is 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 finding all of those engineers that are um, creative and and has a drive and and want to you know find amazing solutions to the problems that they face on a daily basis and that's how we move forward uh, really quickly. If everyone's just doing the tasks that they're told, I think you're not as a company moving forward at the same um, speed. So then in this case, um, the freedom, the autonomy the free working environment basically if, if, if you like um given to, to developers is, is that something they need to kind of enforce for themselves do they just come in okay i can do whatever i like or should there be um an infrastructure for that does the company allow for that or not allow for that if you know what i mean yeah i mean um, I think it has a lot to do. It, it depends on, of course, what, what sort of industry you're in and, and what the kind of uh, boundaries are for uh, for the work that you do. But I think it has a lot to do with um, working on the tool set, supporting the engineers to be able to, to kind of have those great ideas and move forward at the pace that they want and be as autonomous as they want. Um, but I think in most cases, and, and for us as well, we, we work within a set of, of boundaries rules and regulation that I think any any um, corporation has uh, to to kind of um, adhere to. And so you have to be able to have the freedom, but within that kind of um, boundaries, I guess that that's. So Soren, how are you guys doing it then? How, how do you let's talk about Kindred themselves, let's put you guys under the spotlight here, mm -hmm. under the microscope. How do you ensure that um, developers, engineers, the tech teams have that freedom and autonomy and how much of it uh, yeah looking back at the journey we've we've done right from from 20 to 100 to 450 people uh <clears throat> there are different steps uh, along the way that you do have you have to surpass really so a lot of it comes down to to First of all, like Veronica said, having the proper tooling. There should be tooling to to take care of all of the frustrations. Then we need to have, a, um, if we look at it from from different different angles. One angle being managerial. Uh, for for us, it's it's really key that we keep um, the flat culture. A company of our size and a department of my size, it's impossible to have it totally flat, right? Because every employee deserves a good managerial um, experience, which means that your first line line manager cannot have too many uh, direct reports because then you wouldn't have any chance of, of doing um, uh, training, planning, career planning, all of that that you as an employee deserve to have uh, a really good experience with. Uh, so there, there is uh, an unfortunate maybe need for, for hierarchies, but the idea is to make that of less importance than the actual working environment and the delivery. So we basically have uh, a setup with fully autonomous uh, development teams with, uh, or rather we're, we're, we're pushing towards uh, that, where the idea and the hope is to have most, if not all of the skill sets needed uh, embedded in, in the team. So the team then gets to decide how they work um, together with the product owner on what they work on uh, with the right priority. Do they want to work with uh, pair programming or mob programming or, or work from home <laughs> programming or however they best see uh, they can as a team deliver things. Uh, they are fully empowered to decide that for themselves. Then, yes, we operate in a highly regulated environment, which means that there are some outside boundaries that we, we need to have in place. Uh, but our ambition with everything like that is that that should be as hands off as possible and solved by automated processes. Like there are uh, regulations on how we can deploy code to production. So we solve that by having it 100% automated. So you basically click a button and then all of the bureaucratic process is handled for you by software systems rather than uh, manual bureaucra bureaucratic uh, interventions. So, give, would you say then that automation is that the solution you guys have arrived to to solve efficiency and ensure 
that everything is working properly because you are in a regulated environment? Or do you think that's something that all organizations, all types of organizations could benefit from? I, I think it's more general than that. I mean, we, we, we piggyback on that good solution for, for regulatory reasons, but we would have done it anyways. Uh, we do like 12,000 production releases per year. Uh, and, and that's simply not doable if there is a manual step where someone has to manually approve it and, and deploy it to production and, and manually do all that labor, right? So uh, it's, all, it's all dealt with by, by tooling. So I strongly believe that um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, all of that are good practices, solid foundations for, for proper software development, regardless of, of what kind of industry you, you live in. Veronica, for Kindred at the moment, right now, you guys, how, other than obviously the, obviously the automation, how do you support your current engineers and the tech team to ensure that they have a great working culture? As we all know, talent is what makes up any organization. So you want to make sure that you retain your people. At red circa 430 people, that's a lot of people to retain. <laughs> There's a lot of effort. So what do you guys do so well that will help you, or that does help you, retain those people and will help you obviously um, add to that by the end of the year? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's many levels, but I think kind of the, the key ingredient is really listening uh, to the engineers. Uh, what is working, what is not working, what can we improve. Um, but also, I mean, you know, we have had over the years, I think, there to try kind of a million different types of uh, forums. Uh, we had at one point, I think, um, kind of a, you know, sort of a Java forum, a book club, there's been different kinds of, uh, of forums, but sort of driven by by the teams and the engineers themselves uh, to sort of um, align across and, and learn from each other. Uh, we also have sort of um, geek sessions, kind of just promoting knowledge sharing across different teams, uh, learning from each other. Um, you know, if that team did something really awesome or implementing something really cool, maybe we can do it in our team as well. So not this kind of top down approach that someone's telling you, you have to do it in a certain way, but sort of um, uh, uh, horizontal uh, learning from each other, um, kind of promoting that uh, that aspect of it, um, and then just in general, I think you know we have quite strong values within Kindred. Um, I think we focus quite a lot on on uh, we dare to challenge and we seek to innovate. So trying to um, encourage the teams um, to really live those values and what it means for them. Um, so I think it's. It's on sort of many levels um, to sort of work work with the culture that we have. And if I can just add to that, I think also one key, one key ingredient is to, to fail fast. Because, I mean, we have had some probably rubbish ideas implemented over the years where uh, it looked so good on paper, we tried it out, and the feedback from the engineers was that they hated it. And then you have to immediately be courageous enough to just uh, uh, kill it um, and, and uh, that, that I think is one of the dare to challenge but also dare to make mistakes and, and admit to your to your failures and then try to do better hmm. and you, you had a you had a question before as well uh, in regards to kind of sort of why uh, why we can't just do kind of top down uh, on the top we make decisions and then uh, somehow it gets implemented but I think we have a, um, a good example of that um, kind of leading to, to how we work today and the culture that we have today, where um, there were a few engineers that kind of just challenged one little item uh, in, a, in our ways of working. There was a handover between one team to another, uh, and they were just asking, why? Why do we need to do this? Is it some regulation that says we need to do it, or can we remove this? Um, and I think it's those sort of small things or challenging, you know, well, we have this new tool, can we use it in a different way, can we, you know, and that does not come from your Saran, that comes from the people in the team with great ideas, and I think that's coming back to that sort of, we have to listen to those great ideas, I mean, if we're not listening, then of course, it adds no value, right, so it's... Um... So here's a question to you both, then, here's a question to you both, as 
senior members are, uh, of, 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 of the tech team, on the management team, how do you ensure that this autonomy, this creativity that you, or the, or the freedom to be creative that you allow your teams doesn't clash with efficiency and deadlines? That if they need to, sub they, they, we have a deadline we've got to meet, but at the same time, we kind of need to be creative. Mm. What, what's the balance? How do you guys ensure um, you're not delayed, you're not failing, basically? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you rightly say, it's a balance, right? Uh, there is no one way of doing it. You have to constantly balance the, the delivery time versus uh, what you're working on and how you're working on it. I think that the way we generally address it is having business owners working really closely with the teams and, and uh, product owners understanding their day-to-day um, -day understanding what's on their roadmaps, understanding what's on the backlogs. Um, basically, a bit of stakeholder management, right? If you as a stakeholder understands that that this cannot happen by this date, there's no there's no real point in trying to make that deadlines for it. But also, in the cases where a deadline is absolutely necessary, because there are clearly such cases, right? Like a new law passes, you have to be compliant before it, or if, if in our industry, uh, when the when the Euro in the football starts, we need to be ready for it. If we're delayed three weeks, all that work is pointless because the, the event has passed. So in those cases, it's it's absolutely critical that the entire company understands that we need to then make other sacrifices. You can't just enforce uh, deadlines without uh, seeing the holistic view. On, 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 you know, uh, on the note of striking the balance, mm. okay, so do you, at the moment, how, how do you empower those teams? So if a team, you know, you're, tr you're trying to cr um, promote creativity, but at the same time, you don't want to bring a top-down approach, but you want to make sure the balance is right. Do you empower from within? Do you say, okay, well, each team will have one of the most senior members, for example, you're, uh, you're looking after um, ensuring things are done properly. Do you do that or do you simply bring in one of the more senior members to come in to eat, manage each team? What I'm trying to say is, if I can perhaps rephrase it better, is do you promote from within the team itself? Or is it, do they feel that they have a say is, as they stay, as they work within the company, do they have a say later on? Or do they feel like, no, this always comes from the top management, they would be the ones to select, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we, our job, I think, as, as um, the senior leadership team is, is also a lot about shielding the teams from those kind of outside priorities. So basically, you want the, the overarching company priorities to be handled without afflicting the development teams. They shouldn't have to fight for everything that they have on, on their agenda that they have on the backlog. You want them to, to freely work inside the remit of, of their decisioning power. And then we set company strategies and, and have ways of, of dealing with conflicting priorities where um, where all of those things are taken into consideration. And then looking at how we uh, promote both. I mean, we we have sort of a matrix-like uh, functional organization, uh, and the idea is to technically empower uh, developers and testers inside the teams to make um, decisions locally inside the teams for for what they do, and then they have um, line managers on on the other vertical trying to to work with. Um, career planning and, and um, training planning and vacation planning and, and all of those kind of managerial uh, as and, and I would say that a lot of that recruitment is done uh, from within certainly. Going back to you Veronica then I'd like to point to, to, to you, you you said the dare to challenge and seek to innovate you mentioned that this is you know what you guys um, your motto if you like especially on, on, on the tech side what have been the most successful challenges you've had where it was a team effort, it was a innovation um, from within? Um, 
Yeah, maybe Sarah can uh, pick some as well. But I mean, for me, something that really, really stands out is uh, we had to do, this was quite a number of years ago, so kind of a highlight is about the fact that we've been working uh, in a similar way for, for quite a long time. We had to do a database uh, migration where generally in most companies uh, you would sort of take down the site, do the migration uh, and up you go. Uh, but, the standard uh, procedure usually. Yeah, standard procedure usually. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I think that the sort of general um, feeling in in uh, in uh, Kindred is that you know we have really smart people, so we should be able to do this without taking the site down. Uh, and also that we have kind of a we we work a little bit with the sort of um, I don't know if you want to call them challenges, certain, but. Uh, we, we had sort of someone set, kind of the operational manager set, that uh, we uh, we have zero plan downtime. We don't take the site down for anything. So find a solution. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, there were so many teams involved, uh, and there was a solution found, and it was done, uh, uh, you know, uh, without any uh, problems. And I think it just kind of shows that you can solve any problem. Uh, just because you normally do it in a certain way doesn't mean you always have to. And I think when, when that kind of culture is there to sort of um, facilitate and, and sort of the tech organization is saying, you know, fi find another way, be creative here. What can we do as a team? How can we do this in a different way to have, you know, sort of a good customer experience? I think that it's, it's quite inspiring. Uh, and for me, that's one of those sort of key things that sticks out um, as um, quite different, I think. Than, so if we could... I'm guessing we can't really, really, really dig down too deep here, but at least overarching view, what was that solution like? How did you manage to keep the site running 24-7 without taking it down? Yeah, do you? What, what, what was the solution here? If you could give me like, like just a little bit, little bit of an overview at least, either Veronica or Soren. Do you want to go into more detail, Soren? <laughs> no, you can do it. <laughs> you remember. I don't, I don't remember all the stuff. This was quite a number of years ago. I don't remember all the steps. I think there was like a five or six step process for, uh, for how they actually did this. Uh, and having both databases running at the same time and, you know, sort of slowly uh, kind of migrating things over. Um, yeah. So how would that have worked? That's my, this is going to be, this is going to be the big question then. Would that have worked, would you say, if you didn't have the culture that you had currently or at the time at Kindred? That the, if you're saying you have the great working culture, the, the, the team empowerment, the freedom, the autonomy, the open communication, open lines of communication, would that have worked? Would you have arrived at that solution if you didn't have that? No, I don't think so. And, and, and a lot because of the fact that this wasn't, like Veronica said, this was, wasn't really driven from, from higher level management point of view. This was sort of a team saying that, no, we can do better. We really, really don't want to shut the site down for this. There must be a solution for it. So uh, it, it turned into, like like you said, Veronica, into this excited challenge of let's see if this can be doable. And I think that then is the is 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 so ingrained in in how we work today. And looking at the number of releases we do, looking at always trying to to automate, automate, automate. I mean, we're now in a position where we. Um, regardless of load, regardless of, of um, critical business events, we do releases, right? We do releases all the time because we think it's the right thing to do. We don't want uh, code on the shelf, right? You don't want uh, software that, that just sits around the wait. If you have built something, it should go into production. And that mindset is, is I mean, this was one of the, the foundation points for it, I think, really. But it also showed that this can be doable on on these super highly difficult places. So why shouldn't we be able to do it for, for everything? Of course. So potentially one of the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced, uh, the pandemic we're still going through right now. How have you guys uh, fared with that? Because if there has ever been a big, a big test for any company's working culture, especially of your size, it would be this. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we were 
not prepared, but fairly, you know, uh, we had some infrastructure in place to be able to manage this uh, because we are, like Sonia said, we are a global company. So we do, um, you know, use uh, communication tools on a daily basis, even if we were to be in the office, right, because you communicate with people across across the globe continuously. So I think from that perspective, um, we were in a um, maybe better position than, than some other companies. But then I think in general, it's uh, and the social aspect of it is is challenging for for anyone. Um, you know, not being able to kind of have that that uh, um, coffee machine talk or water cooler talk um, that you might just have. Uh, so finding new ways of uh, of communicating, of um, connecting with each other. Um, I think that's probably the same challenge for us as as, as for any company. So yeah. was it then business as usual in this case, uh, if, other than the social aspect of things? Was it always business as usual? Was business not interrupted? Were you carrying on normally, smoothly? Yeah, we were. I mean, we, we were, were really good at, at shifting from everyone working in the office to everyone working at home in, in a matter of, of days, really. Um, <clears throat> but I think that what also is, is key in that is uh, employee mental health and, and well-being. <laughs> and this is where uh, <coughs> the the... Em employee experience of your manager comes in, right? You, you, in an office setting, it's much easier for for a manager to check in daily or regularly with with your employees. It's not as simple uh, in a working from home situation, which means that it's so much more work, actual work, for our managers to reach out to everyone and ensuring that because something like COVID affects people extremely differently. For some, it's like not that much of a deal for someone it's 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 really taking a toll on on their well-being and here is where we i think as a as a company have um, obligation towards an employee to to really give them uh, that support that is needed throughout this so then and i will go back to the <clears throat> mental health side as well by the way i will touch upon that as well in a second but for you guys then going forward do you see yourselves that the offices might not be as needed as they were so post COVID, do you still see remote working um being something that you guys will utilize mostly or will we know are we going to go back to business as usual where people will need to come back to the office if they can etc i think it's going to be a combination and we've always had uh remote working even before um COVID. um you know i mean working globally and, and, and people have families and lives um, to be able to to um, cater to. So we've always had people, um, you know, maybe working a day a week from home or, um, you know, things like that. And I think um, most probably after COVID, uh, the, the, you know, there are some people that are very comfortable with this and this is a, a better setup and they might work a little bit more from home and some people that are really, really looking forward to going back into the office and, and meeting people uh, and they'll be able to do that. So I think uh, it'll definitely be a, a combination of the two um, going forward as well. Will there be, will there be, because yeah, the flexibility of being, you know, working from home, that's, that's fantastic. And I, th I think everybody's going to go in that direction now post COVID, but given the size of Kindred and your reach and how global you are as an organization, will employees, for example, or do they have the option in fact, to be able to be based anyway remotely and simply carry on with their work? Um, and that's a really interesting question. And I think that it, there are so many, there are so many aspects to it uh, from, from a making sure you can do your job point of view. Um, we definitely allow people to work from, um, from where they live, but then you have to add tax situation and uh, you have to add the uh, legal situation and regulatory and so on. So uh, in our industry, I don't think we will ever be in a place where everyone can work from, from whatever country they choose. I don't think, to be honest, that that will ever be possible for any company. I think there has been a lot of, of um, talk about, yeah, work for us, you can work from with wherever. I think that what you miss then is the fact that you need a work visa to work from from many countries so unless you're a resident uh in the country you want to work for you're probably not allowed to now upon you know one of the last points or probably the last point i really want to touch upon and not to really kind of um you know um you know blow blow, blow uh 
kindred th th trump, uh, trumpet if, they, if, uh, if the term is, is the right to use. But mental health, mental health in all the research that we've done, people we've spoken with, any company, there's always the uh, positive and negative reviews in general. That's a, that's a common thing. But what's very, very, very common among many people is positive experience of how Kindred deals with mental health. What is it that you guys do? I really want to know. What is it that you guys do that makes people speak highly of that? Veronica, we can start with yourself if you like, and then we can move to Soren or vice versa. It doesn't matter. You can start, Veronica. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, since I started in 2012, it's been uh, a topic on the table. Um, and I think, you know, sort of understanding that our people are, are you know, main um, asset, it's, it's what, uh, what's, uh, what, you know, makes the company. Um, so, um, yeah, if, if, if we don't have a workforce that, that's happy and healthy, then, then we have nothing, right? So I think it's always been a, a topic of conversation. We've uh, worked on it in, in many different forms we've had throughout the years different speakers coming in on stress, on anxiety. We've had, you know, like lots of different sort of external um, parties coming into different offices and, and doing presentations and um, awareness months and things like that. So it's been kind of a, a focus for a very long time. And I think also within our um, management staff, um, it's a, a big um, topic um, to ensure that everyone gets um, the same experience, basically, the same managerial experience, irregardless of, of what manager you have. Um, there's sort of a, a set of, of criteria for, for how your experience should be as an employee. So I think, um, yeah, a lot of focus. And, and it's also something that, that is, is really ingrained in, in I mean, work-life balance is something that is not just words, right? It's, it's if you look at our top level executive management work-life balance is something they live and breathe every day themselves so it the culture comes from from within and it has been been like that for for a number of years and then um, adding on to work-life balance with actually looking at workplace mental health and 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 uh, outside work mental health and and really not only talking about it but if we I mean, we've done surveys over the years where we see that stress levels are are getting high then we then we action it uh, we, we really make sure to do some proper changes then into what is causing this, this sudden burst of stress. Are we committing to too much? Are we doing too many things at the same time? And then there is a, a, a clear alignment across everyone that, okay, stress is, is really bad. It's, it's not going to lead to sustainable long-term delivery. So we, we need to action it um, immediately and, and reduce stress levels to be able to continue. Awesome. So I'd like to end then by now. I'd like to end by giving both of you a platform to just tell me the one thing you've learned over the years in your own experience, whether it's at Kindred, whether it's out of Kindred, that contributes. And other than obviously just the autonomy and the freedom, something specific that contributes towards that great engineering working culture, specifically from a developer's point of view, obviously. Veronica, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, the one thing that I've learned over the years, um, I think it, I mean, it really comes down to that sort of um, team culture, how you, how you work within the team, how you, um, yeah, it's like collaboration and and uh, communication within the teams. Um, that's really kind of the key. If you can, if you can get the teams to to have sort of a great team culture, then you know people are happy coming to work. They're more productive, more creative, and that sort of fosters a, a great engineering culture. I think it has to come from within the teams, uh, and and for us just to kind of support that um, with whatever's needed to to be able to to have the teams to kind of um, uh, drive that themselves. So give the developers the platform to voice their opinions at what they yeah. want. Soren, what about you? 
Um, for me, it's it's uh, to never ever under underestimate the the creativity and and uh, the the amazing things that can be built by uh, highly functioning teams. Uh, making sure then that we allow those teams to really get both empowered but also passionate about what they are are working on. So they understand, they have a sense of purpose, but they also have the freedom and empowerment to actually be creative towards it. Uh, so f making sure that all managers fully understand that their purpose is all about empowering engineers and teams uh, making sure that their path is as free of obstacles as possible because it's going to be uh, a force of nature when when you get it right fantastic fantastic so veronica thank you guys very much for uh joining us today we've definitely uh discussed quite a few things interesting actually to know as well because um in 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 our experience here in the community we speak to a lot of different companies primarily startups but even the larger ones that we speak with, working culture has always been something that they talk about. But when it comes to really questioning on how things are being practiced, you start to think, hmm, it's probably not being put into practice. But um, it's, it's great to see that you guys are doing that, which is fantastic. And that's not just from here. This is also from the, I mean, anybody who wants to do research, they can go onto Glassdoor or any other uh, platform and, uh, you know, the reviews, the people's reviews speak for themselves. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys very much once again. It was great having you on our podcast, and uh, I wish you a lovely rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.